If you like old houses and you're mad about antiques, you got to promise yourself a visit to Newport, Rhode Island. And this would be a great place to get started. It's known as King's Coat, a Gothic Revival cottage, and it's full of some great things. Come on. Look at this, a classic Newport secretary. But over here in front of this overstuffed settee is what I really want you to see, this butler's table. It's a base and a tray. The idea was that the beverage service would be prepared elsewhere in another room in the house, set on the tray, and carried in here to be served. Now I'd like to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your tools. Knowing how to use your tools safely will greatly reduce the possibility of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Now I'll show you how I built today's project. This butler's table is a nice project. And when it came time for me to build the prototype, the most difficult thing was finding these butler's tray hinges. I finally located some at my woodworker's supply shop, and these are solid brass, and they have a special function. There's a little built-in spring that holds the sides up so they won't fall down. And at the same time, when you flip it down, they have a little ledge which holds the leaf horizontal so that you don't need any support underneath. Now, when you go around and look at the knockoff versions at furniture stores, you want to check a couple things. We noticed that a lot of them were put together with metal angles in the corner. This is a true mortise and tenon joint. The other thing that I noticed was that a lot of the tops were veneer plywood. This one is solid mahogany. This is a real nice project, can be easily accomplished in a weekend, and we'll get started today with this big portion of the top. Now over here I've laid out four one by sixes. I've tried to put them together so that the grain patterns blend in with one another so that when it's all glued up it looks as much like one piece as possible. And I put some little score marks on it to keep them in the right orientation. Now I can't glue up from here, I've got to solve a problem. If you look at this board you see it's tight here and it's tight here. There's a big gap in the middle. So I'm going to turn to my joiner to straighten those edges. Let's see how that looks. Okay, we still have a gap. I know this board is straightened, so now I'll make a couple passes on this one. Okay, let's see what that did. Okay, that took care of the problem. Now I'll take care of the other joints. Let's see. That's good. Now that's what it should look like. All the boards tightly fitting together without any clamp pressure. And now we're ready to join them together. I could use just glue on each edge, or I could use dolls. But the newest technique is biscuit joinery. And here's the little biscuit, which is made of beech. And when a little glue gets on there, it's going to swell up and never come apart. And along with the biscuits, you have a tool which cuts slots in the wood for the biscuits, and there's a little saw blade in there. Now what I've done is put the boards together and just put a pencil mark across the joint at each location. Here I'm going to put five. They don't have to be very precise, just a little mark. And I'll take the board over to my vise, clamp it in place, and then just set the tool on the edge of the board, aligning my pencil mark with this indicator mark on the tool. And then I just cut the slot. And that's how the biscuit goes in. Now I'll cut all the slots in the remaining edges. With all the glue applied, we're ready to join them together. It's as simple as just aligning all the biscuits and clamping it up. Okay, now I'll just set this aside to dry, and we'll start working on the base. The base consists of legs, rails, 
and a cross brace to support the bottom. I'm going to get started with the legs. Each leg has two mortises. And what they do is accept the rails, the tenons of the rails. I have some inch and five eighths square blanks of mahogany, and I've laid out the location of the mortise. And I come over here to a tool which is really nothing more than a router. Doesn't that do a great job? The next step is to knock off the inside corner of each leg. That allows me a flat spot to fit the cross brace into later. Plus, it makes the leg a little more elegant. And to do that, all I'm going to use is the table saw. I've tilted the blade to 45 degrees, and I've set the fence in the right position. And I want to make sure I use a push stick as I go through the last few inches. Let me show you something at the prototype. Each of the legs has a little mortise into which the cross brace will fit. And that mortise is perpendicular to the angle that we've just cut. So once again, I'm going to use my overhead router, except that I've made a little cradle here. And what that does is holds the leg in the right position for the mortising. It's just a 90 degree cut in a thick piece of wood. I've changed the bit to quarter inch, and I'll just mortise each of the legs. Now we're ready for some tenons. I'll take this one out here. And each rail has a tenon. And the first cut that I want to make is the shoulder cut on the flat surfaces. And I'll do that over on my table saw, where I've set up a gauge block, which will control the length of the tenon. It's an inch and a sixteenth from the outside of my saw blade. And I've raised the blade to 3 sixteenths of an inch. And now I'll make the shoulder cut on each end of all the rails. I've just made another adjustment to the saw, raising it to 3 eighths of an inch for a shoulder cut at the top and the bottom of each rail. And since there are so few rails, I'll remove the rest of the material by a process called nibbling. The last cut to make the tenon is called the cheek cut. And that's removing this material right along this edge. I'm going to use my tenoning jig, which is a heavy cast device made by the size manufacturer. And it runs in the same slot as the miter gauge runs. And what it does is it holds the wood vertically and perpendicular to the saw table. It works great. Take a look. Remember that the mortises have little rounded corners because of the router bit. So I'm going to take my sharp utility knife and just sort of whittle away the corners of the tenon so it'll fit in there. The mortises that are in the leg intersect one another. So that means that when I slide the tenon in, they're going to hit one another unless I miter them back. And I'll use my miter box to do that. And I'll just knock the corners off. Now over here on my table saw, I've installed a molding head cutter. It's a heavy wheel into which you fasten cutters. There's three cutters that go in it. You can see those right there. Now generally, you buy it as a kit, which comes with several different cutters that you can interchange. For instance, here's one that'll cut a quarter round. You want to make sure you secure the cutters in tightly. And once it's set up, you can mold your edges. Now for our rails, I want a bead, a single bead. Unfortunately, this cutter has a triple bead. So what I'm going to do is bury it or cover it. And 
how I do that is attach a wooden block to my rip fence and just conceal those first two cutters and at the same time protect the cutters from hitting the metal rip fence. Well, now, you're going to have to be a little fussy with these adjustments, and I'm going to run a sample on some scrap before I commit to my mahogany. Now I'll bead the leg, too. Notice that I push the wood through real slowly, and that's so I can minimize any chipping. For the finishing touch on the legs, I'm going to round over the outside corner of each leg. And to accomplish that, I'm going to use my router, which is equipped with a 3 8 inch beading bit. Now's a good time to dry fit all the pieces together so that you can check the joints and make sure that they're properly cut. And at the same time, you want to take a couple diagonal measurements, which are the measurements corner to corner. And if those two measurements are equal, we know that the base of the table is square. So now we're ready to move on to the next step, which is to work on the cross brace, which is at the bottom of the table. And if you look at it, you can see that the two pieces are lapped over in one another with a half lap joint. Now, if the table had been a perfect square, the angle of the cut would have been 45 degrees. But since this is a rectangle, it changes. And I've calculated the angle to be 28 degrees. So I'm going to start out with a couple pieces of stock, which are extra long to be trimmed off later, onto which I've laid out a 28 degree angle right in the middle. I'm going to cut both pieces at the same time here with my radial arm. I've set the radial arm up so that it'll remove half the thickness. And just like on the table saw, I'm going to nibble away the material in the middle. That's good. With the cross brace sitting on my bench and the leg assembly flipped upside down on top of it, what I try to do is align all the cross brace members so that they're centered in this flat portion on the inside of the leg. And once I'm happy that they're all in the center, I'll just put a mark indicating that intersection. I can just move the assembly out of the way. And now I can slip these apart and transfer the lines all the way around each end. Now those two layout lines are for the tenon. And they're 90 degrees to this shoulder cut. Because remember, the mortise that was cut in the back of the leg is 90 degrees to this surface. So for in order that for the two to fit correctly, they must be cut at an angle. And I'll make those cuts on my bandsaw. I just use my little dovetailing saw to finish up the tenon. When I made the prototype, I put a little decorative edge on the top of the cross brace. And I stopped it about four inches back from the intersection. To do that, I just used my overarm router, which is now equipped with a quarter inch round nose bit and this feather board to hold the work tightly up against the rip fence. Oh, 
Well, one final check of all the joints, make sure they fit properly. And then I'll disassemble it, lightly sand it, and I'll be ready to glue it up. Now the trick here is that I have to glue up all the joints and slip them together before I can put any clamps on. So I'm going to have to move pretty quickly before the glue sets up. Well, I could probably get away without clamping any of this, but I want to just make sure that I can pull those joints tightly together. So I'm going to use this little band clamp, which is really nothing more than a piece of nylon strap. And over here on this middle part, there's a little ratchet, which tightens up the strap. So it should pull everything nicely together. Now is also a good time to take a damp sponge and wipe off any excess glue that's squeezed out. Well, while that dries, let's go to work on the top, which is dried by now. I'm going to unclamp it, scrape off the excess glue, and sand it. First thing I'll do is rip it to width, which is going to be 20 and 3 quarters inches. Now I'll just take it over to my joiner and dress up that edge. Now using my panel cutter, I've squared one end, and I'll cut it to length, which is going to be 32 inches. The next part of the project could prove to be the most tedious part, mortising all these hinges so that they're flush with the table surface. There's eight hinges in all. And I suppose you could chisel them by hand with a chisel and a mallet, but that takes a lot of time. So I figured out a way to do it with my router. Now, you're going to have to make a jig. And the jig is very dependent upon the size of the hinge, the size of the mortising bit that you use, and the size of the router base. What the jig is is a piece of plywood that's been cut out, a little box in the middle. And it allows the router to ride up against it and cut out a mortise. Now, I had to readapt this one. I've added some cleats because it was previously used for a wider hinge. And once I cut a couple samples, I ended up with a perfectly aligned width on the hinge, and it'll also set the depth correctly. This guy keeps it squarely aligned with the side of the tabletop. And I simply slide it over to my layout line, clamp it down. I'll just run the router through it. Take a look. Now this little tool is a corner chisel. There's a chisel in there that's spring-loaded in a guide, and it helps me remove this round portion that still remains. You hold it up against the cut that's already there, strike the chisel with a hammer, and it squares it right up. Now that I've got the mortise made in the tabletop and all the leaves, there's one more step. If we look at the hinge, there's a spring on the bottom of it, and that helps hold the leaves in the vertical position. So I need to route out a little more material to allow for that spring. And all I've done is modified the jig by adding some thicker sides for a narrower mortise and lowered my router to make it deeper.
Now I'm ready to lay out the shape of the leaves using a pattern. I'll just trace the outline and cut it over on my bandsaw. I'm using the drum sander mounted in my drill press to smooth up the rough edges. Take another look at the prototype with me. Along the top edge of each leaf is this little cove detail made with this quarter inch round nose bit. The bit doesn't have a bearing to guide me along the edge and I can't do it freehand or else I'd be all over the place. So the manufacturer of my router makes this attachment that goes on the base and it has a little roller which guides the bit along the edge of the work. What I've set up here is a template of the hand hole cutout that's on top of one of the side leaves. And I need one of those hand cutouts in each of the four leaves. I'll use my router with sort of an unusual bit. It's a straight cutter, but the bearing is here at the top of the bit rather than at the bottom. And the bearing will simply follow the template, removing the material for the cutout. Now I'll use the hole that I just drilled as a starting point. That sure makes the job easy. For the final routing operation, I've installed a quarter inch rounding over bit, and that's to ease the edges on both sides of the cutout. Well, with the last screw in place, this project is nearly complete. But not before I take the base and center it on the bottom side of the top, and then add these little corner blocks, which will align the top with the base. Well, let's see how it operates. Not bad. I'd say it's just about time to call Jeeves to bring in the tea, but not before I figure out a way how to finish it. This is a difficult piece to stain. If I take the hardware off, I'll have five individual pieces to handle, and I'm concerned that the finish won't be uniform. But if I leave the hardware on, I'm bound to get some stain on it. However, it's been protected with a lacquer finish, and I should be able to wipe off any excess later. By the way, the stain that I'm using here is a wild cherry and that'll give me that classic mahogany look. For the finish on my table, I want a hard, shiny finish. And to get that, I'm using a gloss, water-soluble polyurethane. It's interesting how it goes on. It's a little bit milky, but it'll dry crystal clear, and it's very hard. Mm -hmm.